So spring and summer, um, when their populations explode, again, um, it might look like deer damage, but it's going to be lower to the ground and, and clean cut cuts, uh, clean cut um, uh, cuts, whatever. Yeah, clean can cuts. I ask a question about that, though? I, I, I'm struggling a little bit with differentiating deer and rabbit damage um, because of so they're, round, they're they're smaller animals too. So right. even though they're clean cut, would they be? Would you see evidence of the chew the clean cut chewing within a week? I, I'm specifically thinking about the fact that I have coral bells, which right now have a bunch of stakes up and all the leaves, right. which are about this big, have been eaten off, which seems to be more like a mouthful for a deer. But could that have been a rabbit, and then they just ate the whole thing off? Absolutely. And I just don't have that. Okay. I can yeah. describe it because it's not a, it's not a straight, I mean, if they had ripped it, the leaf, it could have had the same look since the whole leaf was Right. And, and it can be hard to tell. I, okay. Look for droppings because if okay. they're eating long enough, they're going to leave some droppings. And deer droppings are going to be substantially larger than the rabbit droppings. And you also, deer, depending on the surface around there, you might see deer traps. Yes. So yes. their hooves are going to be deeper. So look for some. Um, Okay, thank you. Track marks too. Um, yeah, they can. They eat bark too. The um, uh, well, deer will also, but the rabbits will um, eat bark on young trees and stuff. And they can, um, they can gurgle trees and kill them that way. So um, strategies for controlling rabbits. Um, the saying that um, about rabbits breeding like rabbits is really true. So. <laughs> Exponential increases, they uh, have incredible capacity to reproduce. So I think they can have five or six litters a year, um, 18, 18 babies a year. <laughs> so you're really, you're not going to eliminate the rabbit population. But the good news about rabbits is that they really tend to cycle. So you may have a really, really bad rabbit year and you know, do everything you can to, um, to try to reduce the damage, and then the next year you may have rabbits at all and some of that is from natural predation because the, the predators come in and find them and um, help take care of them as, as well but some things that you can do if you do have problems with them um, are going to be exclusion habitat modification repellents and then either trapping or shooting so a rabbit fence doesn't have to be very tall um, two feet is plenty high uh, it doesn't even have to be that sturdy they're not going to be really pushing too hard against it but you do need to either bury it in the ground or keep it very tight to the ground so they don't uh, push underneath. And the mesh size has to be an inch or less because a small rabbit, if you think about it, if their head can fit through, the rest of their body can fit through it. So you can use hardware cloth if you're going to protect like individual um, tree trunks or something. But a uh, quarter inch hardware cloth, if it's going to be close to the trunk, otherwise, like an inch mesh, they can actually get their teeth in there unless you move it away from the bark. Um, there's tapes that you can wrap around trunks. You have to remove those periodically because the, the tree is going to have to have room to grow. And you can protect individual plants if they're um, very precious plants. You can make little cages of chicken wire or something. They don't look that great in your garden, but sometimes <laughs> desperate times call for desperate measures. This is a really good one, though, and um, it's always a trade off. I mean, we didn't talk about it in the beginning, but you know, sometimes you, you want to encourage. Wildlife, and so leaving brush piles and things is, you know, increases the diversity of wildlife and the habitat for them. But that also brings in the creatures that are going to be eating your garden. So if you have a lot of brush piles, weed patches, 
um, at least try to move them farther away from your house or your garden um, to keep them farther away uh, or eliminate them entirely because these are really, that's what's bringing the rabbits in because they have good places to hide. So repellents can work for rabbits too. Um, the, just like the deer, the area repellents are things that are going to repel by odor. Um, people have talked about blood meal being effective. You also have to be careful with things like that, also like fish emulsion um, that you spread out because sometimes dogs can be attracted to that too and they can cause as much damage by digging around in your house. Um, something you can try though. The contact repellents are probably going to be a little bit more effective. Those are the things that you're going to spray on your plants and just like with the deer, there's commercial sprays that are made just for rabbits and, uh, and you can try spraying your plants. But just like deer, a really hungry rabbit is, um, may eat some of that as well. So rabbits are considered a game animal and um, therefore protected. And you will need a permit to trap or kill them. And trapping can be useful in urban or suburban areas where, um, where you can't shoot them, if that's something that you're interested in doing. Um, but you would want to consult with someone like an image control agent about getting the appropriate permits and also um, the release procedures because you don't want to release any animal where it could be a nuisance to someone else. Um, if you are somewhere where um, shooting is allowed, you can allow access to hunters who <coughs> excuse me, might be interested in um, taking care of your population. And then also remember that predators are really going to help you too. So be tolerant of hawks, owls, snakes, even if your neighbor's cat seems to be around a lot. That happened one time. It wasn't rabbits, but it was voles. My neighbor's cat was spending so much time in my yard and I couldn't figure out why and I realized it was hunting voles and I was like, come on over. Uh, yes, they do. That is a great point. Um, we will get a lot of questions about moles and voles. So it, um, it's, it's a good idea to <coughs> understand them. A lot of people don't even know that there's a difference between a mole and a vole. Um, and then, and they're pretty different, and their control measures are also pretty different. So you'll want to know which is which. So moles are carnivores, or more specifically, insectivores. Uh, so they are not eating your plants. So that is very important. The moles are not eating your plants. What they are eating is the grubs, worms, beetles, and insect larvae that are living in the ground. Um, and in search of these things, they may be disrupting your plants. So moles are incredible diggers. They can cover a lot of ground in one day, tunneling through your yard, and sometimes they can um, disrupt the, the sod, the, you know, the soil around your plant roots and expose them to air, and so your plants may suffer because of that. Um, but they are, not, they are not eating your plants. Also, people sometimes don't like just the tunnels that they see. Um, this is the star-nosed mole. This is uh, one of a couple types of moles that are at risk of becoming endangered. So the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission has protected moles by law, and that means that you have to have a permit from the commission before you can you know, kill moles. And voles, on the other hand, these are the ones that are eating your plants. And they can cause extensive damage um, to gardens. They are vegetarians, they eat plants, roots, and bark. And I mentioned earlier that there's two types of voles. So there's the pine vole and then the meadow vole. And the pine voles live underground in tunnels. Um, they'll often use, if moles have been around, they uh, are lazy and will use mole tunnels instead of digging their own. Um, and most of the damage that voles do is under the soil line. So you'll see a perfectly healthy plant one day and the next day it's just collapsing and you pull it up and you realize that gone. They're very, very frustrating. Um, meadow voles tend to live in more grassy areas, open areas, and they use the, the grass and the ground cover to, um, to move around under cover without going underground. And so the damage that they're going to do is right at the soil line, so right at the um, root collar. So if you see tunnels, um, look for golf ball shot golf ball sized holes because voles will come up so they'll have little openings um, where they can come and go from the tunnels um, whereas moles almost never come out so if there are no holes at all it's more likely to be moles um, 
holes would indicate holes. <laughs> Say that really fast. But there's another way to test, um, and this is the after sign test. So if you want to find out if it's moles or voles, and you've got tunnels, so you take a couple different locations and you're going to um, unearth the tunnels. You take the top off of the tunnel, and basically you're just going to put a piece of an apple in the tunnel in various places, and then get a shingle or a piece of wood or something, so you can cover it back up and, and um, keep light from getting in the tunnel. And then you wait 24 hours, and then you go and check. And moles are not going to be interested in the apple, but if they've been eaten or removed, then you have voles using the runs. So you want to know what you're after. And voles can be very challenging to get rid of. So they have reproductive potential that is similar to rabbits. Um, you have some lethal options, but you have to get a permit from the Wildlife Resources Commission to kill voles as well. Um, you can trap or poison voles. Um, you can also remove or, or decrease habitats that they like, um, exclude them from specific plants, and also of note, there's all, all sorts of things out there that are sort of gimmicks to get rid of um, voles, but none of these have been proven to be effective. So don't get chewing gum and stick it in the hole and things like that. Um, mothballs, um, those things aren't going to work. Well, what are they, like pinwheels and things? So trapping is probably one of your most effective ways, especially if you don't have a huge population. And you're just going to use a regular mouse trap, um, snap type trap that you can get for like a dollar um, at the store. And bait it with uh, either an apple, which they like, or peanut butter, oatmeal, mixed together is a good bait. And just like when you did the apple sign test, you'll excavate some of the tunnels to look for, um, look for straight runs, which are easier to get into. Um, take out enough of the tunnel that you can put the trap in at right angles, and then cover the whole thing with a shingle. And then just check it periodically and until you stop catching bowls. Um, there are some toxicants that are labeled for use against bowls, but you really need to be careful to prevent exposure to non-target animals like pets and children. So just be really, really careful if you're going to use anything um, toxic and make sure you read your label very carefully. Um, just like with the rabbits, the um, habitat modification can be really helpful um, to reduce damage. So keep your grass and weeds mostly close. Ground covers um, are good habitat, so uh, decrease the amount of ground covers, especially around um, susceptible plants that they like to eat. Keep your mulch cleared away from um, the trunks of shrubs and trees so that uh, it doesn't provide cover for the uh, meadow voles. And there are also things that you can incorporate into the soil, um, products like oyster shells, and there's other commercial products, like if you're planting a bed of um, bulbs or something, that you can mix into the soil that's supposed to make it less friendly for them to dig in. Um, I don't think we have anything uh, in our extension material that either is for or against these products, but um, they might be worth a try, especially if you're putting in new plants. Um, you can try to exclude them because they dig so well. It's really hard. Um, you know, I look at this wrapping a hardware cloth around trees and burying it six inches in the ground seems really labor intensive. That would have to be a pretty special tree, I think, to try to dig it something six inches in the ground and around the tree. But that um, supposedly is effective against bowls. So if you find that it's moles and not voles, um, a good question to ask for moles is, it, is it something that you really need to control or can you tolerate the tunnels? So if you look at it, that the moles are actually aerating your lawn for you. So, uh, so think positive. Um, they're actually eating the grubs that are becoming Japanese beetles or would have become Japanese beetles. So they actually can be kind of helpful. A lot of it is just cosmetic damage. And believe it or not, all of those extensive mole tunnels is probably one mole, maybe two. Um, they tend to be pretty solitary. Um, so they may move on to your neighbors or somewhere else if you just wait long enough. Um, and 
If you have to get rid of them, you can trap them. Uh, you have to have a special mold trap and you do need a permit. And so to that permit, um, I just want to know why. And did you need a permit to get bowls as well? Yes. <coughs> why? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> So it's covering the mold. Yeah, the, the okay. mold permit is to try and cover the mold as well because most people don't know what those are. Well, and that's that was one of the questions I had too because it says um, that there's now actually um, <coughs> baits for molds, which they didn't have before, but they're only for the hairy tail and the eastern mold, but not the star nose mold. And you can trap the star nose mold if there's heavy, heavy damage. So you, all of this, you just have to talk with the, the wildlife agents the, at the Wildlife Commission. But how you know whether you have a star nose mole or a, or a common mole, I'm not really sure until it's too late. Um, so I guess if you have a mole problem and you really want to use lethal methods, then you need to talk with the wildlife person or the, um, the Wildlife Commission and, and get the information from them. That would be my recommendation. How long does it take to get a permit? The yeah. permits are free, okay. um, and I imagine it wouldn't take long at all. I think you just have to get rid of them, and um, I, I haven't done them, so I'm not sure. I know that the permit is free, and I know that if they do have to come out and provide services, that those um, do have charges associated with them. I'm on their website now, so I was researching my crops and pet food. Uh, um, and there's also a permit link there, and the dates that you're allowed to hunt them. So oh, you, well, you just go to the North Carolina Wildlife. Yeah, there's a, a lot of information there. Um, so yeah, I, I think consulting with them, especially with the um, using a, a toxic bait or something like that to figure out your strategy. Um, but the, some other strategies is just go out and like walk, you know, it's good exercise, you know, walk down those tunnels and smash them all. And sometimes that'll discourage them. Um, it's said that that can even kill them somehow. I mean, I guess if you just happen to hit them, on them it's on the other side, I mean, you wouldn't know. But all you got to get is one, or maybe two, to take care of things. Um, interestingly, this um, reducing their food source with insecticides, we've really come a long way. So in the past, there used to be a product, I think, was it diazinon? And literally, it's like, well, let's kill every living thing in your yard. Um, how great is that? Uh, you know, just like. You know, we used to like, let's take antibiotics and get rid of all those you know, germs inside you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're realizing how important this biome is, whether it's inside us or in our soil. Um, so the last thing you probably want to do is go out and you talk about a shotgun approach. Well, it just kill everything in the yard so there's nothing left to eat. Um, so we certainly wouldn't want to recommend that anymore. For a time, we were recommending um, something called milky spore, which is a, an organic, it's Bacillus thuringiensis, and that actually attacks the grubs, the Japanese beetle grubs. So the idea was that you put milky spore out, and that continues to um, repopulate in your soil and you know, eats the grubs, and then you don't have the grubs, so you don't have the moles. Um, but more recent evidence or research has shown, I think, that they're, it's not particularly effective and probably not worth your time and money to do that. So, does that help? I put some synthetic gravel out when we had our deep drain pump, and I have, and I used to have a pump as well, and now I don't. But where I didn't put the gravel, I put it out the pump. So it's, it's great for breaking down clay for all animals, but I have no idea. Mm -hmm. But it's, I mean, it doesn't go very far. <coughs> a bag would be like permatail or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Well, I got it everywhere. Well, you know, we had a big truck. She bought a truckload. We <laughs> <laughs> did because um, we had drainage issues as well. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's an option. I think it's hard if you have a huge area to do. I mean, if you're starting from zero um, or, or renovating an area and you've had a lot of problems, then that would probably be a good idea. A lot of times people have established landscapes and then, you know, the plants start disappearing, you know. <laughs> it's gone. So. So we think we have um, dealt with the bowl community with the sonic thing. Um, Mary, Mary, one 
one season to the next, we made a big difference. How can we make a big difference? Any, any group of that? Uh, they say that any of those things are not proven effective. So it's, uh, it's like what I say for plantar fasciitis, it's whatever you're doing when it's left is what you say works. So everybody, you know, when the bowl's left, whatever you were doing, that's, that's your um, treatment. But yeah, I think um, studies have shown that, it's, that you don't get consistent results with those things. But you're welcome to try, because sometimes it makes people feel better just to do something. All right. Raccoons. Um, I'm just going to talk about them really briefly. These are nocturnal. Um, it, they like watermelon and sweet corn in particular, so if you have a, a big garden like that, you might have to deal with raccoons. Um, they also get into garbage cans, um, bird feeders. And they do something called sod rolling. So I guess if you have uh, fresh sod put down, they're really excited about that. Oh, they roll it right back. I think they should hire them on the sod farm, you know. So come back the next morning and all the sod is rolled up and ready to go. And oh, they can also carry rabies, too. That's another reason that you might not want raccoons around. Um, electric wire is a good deterrent for raccoons. You can protect individual ears of corn by putting plastic bags over them, or there's this special glass yarn filament tape that you can um, wrap around. This seems really labor intensive to me, but I guess if you really, really want your sweet corn, you might be willing to do that. I think the electric wire around a fence is probably um, maybe the easiest way to keep them out of like a big vegetable garden or something like that. Um, keep your garbage you know, lids on tight, secured. Helps keep them away. Don't feed your pets outside. You need pet food outside. Those are the obvious things that are going to attract them. Um, if the sod rolling is an issue, uh, sometimes you have to actually just pin down the sod, the um, sod pin, I guess. Uh, and you can trap them if you're having a huge problem, uh, but you would need to talk to the wildlife damage control agent to, um, to do that. So, um, <laughs> Yeah. Yes. This, this is my squirrel, and I don't know if like we have new squirrels or something, but I never thought that squirrels were a problem until they were. And I mean, you used to be able to grow like tomatoes in your, in your backyard, and now I can't. And I've talked to so many people who cannot grow tomatoes and other things. They eat everything. They, they eat like wrought iron furniture. I mean. It's, they're just so destructive. Yes. Yes. It, it, yeah, it is very frustrating. Um, you can get um, squirrel-proof bird feeders. I've actually been successful in that. So there are squirrel-proof bird feeders. Um, and, you know, whether the big old baffles and keeping away from trees. So I, I know that that is possible. Um, I will tell you, you know, what I have read that can work. <laughs> but I think it's really challenging squirrels have um, discovered your garden, and there's so many different things that they can damage. Um, they eat everything. Um, they talked about um, seeds, sprouts, nuts, tomatoes, fruits, corn, flower buds. They dig. They dig yes. in your flower pots, um, newly planted beds. They don't, I mean, do you know what one is it? They don't Remember where the nuts yeah. are? <laughs> so they Why are you in the pot? There's nothing in there. <laughs> and, and they're busy. They're busy 24 7. So no matter what you are doing, they have more time to devote to this process than you do. Um, and on top of that, they can also like short out transformers. They run along the lines and they zap them also in your power um, They get into your attics, nesting, and you can hear them running back and forth. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. like elephants up there. Sounds like everybody's had some elephants. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so exclusion. Um, the squirrels in the attic thing, you need to seal your attic openings. You might have to get help doing this. Um, the companies that will come in and help um, to look for the access points and to seal them off, you want to make sure that you don't seal them in. Um, and one way you can do that is you can actually put like a live trap in the attic once you've sealed everything, but check it very frequently um, and make sure, don't leave it up there because you don't want to trap a squirrel and, um, and not remember that. So, 
And, but that also helps to know that you've actually gotten all the access points by putting it, leaving the chop in there and checking it every day for a while, making sure that you don't have any, and you can date that with um, peanut butter or nuts or wrought iron furniture. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, if you have individual trees that are very isolated, you can protect them with a two foot wide metal band that you wrap around the tree and it's um, six feet up the trunk. But the tree has to be at least six or eight feet away from anything else. Uh, other trees are structures, but the squirrel will just jump back and forth because they are um, pretty good at structures. Does that mean, regular squirrel or flying squirrel? Because they ignore it. Uh, yeah, flying squirrels could probably cover more ground than that. So, I don't, I don't know if flying squirrels are causing all of the damage. They just, they don't seem quite as numerous as the, the more common squirrels. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we've seen them here and there, but I think it's the other squirrels, the non-flying ones. Um, so you can fence garden areas with one inch. You, it needs to be one inch or smaller wire mesh chicken wire, poultry wire, something like that. Um, it doesn't have to be particularly high, like for deer fence, but you do need to bury it or um, curve it out at the bottom, um, or they'll go underneath it, and electrify it, like we'll, um, electric wire along the top, and sometimes an electric wire along the bottom as well, and we'll keep them out of an area. But again, as long as there's no overhanging branches or anything, that they can jump in. Right. Um, <laughs> You have to have electric wire. Yeah. Yeah. You have to electrify the top. Exactly. And you can protect bulbs. Um, like if you have a bulb patch, you can put in like, um, basically you have to excavate the whole area, put in chicken wire, put the bulbs in, and put the chicken wire on the top. It's like a big chicken wire box. Um, but that can work to keep them from digging up bulbs. Um, you can um, trim the trees. So if you do have trees that are really close to the house and you can root the branches to um, six or eight feet away, that would limit their access. Um, some people report that if you feed the squirrels, like corn or something, away from your um, plants and bird feeders, that that keeps them busy doing something else. I haven't actually tried that. Just the thought of like purposely feeding them. I don't know. <laughs> Anybody have luck with that? So um, the most effective control is going to be getting rid of squirrels, and that also requires permits um, because they're considered game animals. Um, if shooting is permitted, you can see if somebody will shoot your squirrels if you don't want to do it yourself. Um, you can also use live traps to catch your squirrels and, um, and relocate them. They have to be relocated to private property with written permission from the property owner. Oh, yeah, no. <laughs> and I will also tell you that they need to be at least five, if not ten miles away, or they will beat you back to the garden. <laughs> and I have seen online people who would, um, they put like a little dot of spray paint on the squirrels to see if the squirrels made it back. And I saw a squirrel in my neighborhood that had blue spray paint. <laughs> like somebody has been doing this. I don't know if they dumped them in our neighborhood or if um, somebody in our neighborhood did it and it made its way back. But, um, but yeah, they can travel really, really far. So, um, and I'm not sure how well they fare when you put them in some other territory. Um, it, it, it's always tough, but you know, getting rid of them is going to be the best thing for your garden. And if you do this, uh, you can bait the traps with peanut butter or <coughs> some peanuts, sunflower seeds, or you can get just about anything. Um, but what is helpful is when they are in the trap, if you put a towel over it or something, it, it keeps them really calm. Um, you can also like put them in big, like an old mulch bag or something like that. Put the trap in there as you're relocating them, taking them somewhere. And um, so that doesn't cause them undue stress until they actually get released. So the last thing I'm going to talk about, um, I'll go through this pretty quickly, is snakes. And people seem to have a fear of snakes that's really out of proportion to their danger. Um, snakes don't cause any damage in the garden. And in fact, they're, um, they may be there because they're eating the rodents, mold, mold, and things that um, 
and insects that might otherwise be pests in your garden. Those snakes are not aggressive. Um, they want to get away from you as much as you want to get away from them. And we only have three venomous snakes um, in our immediate area. So the canebrake rattlesnake, I've never actually seen one of these, um, but supposedly uh, they can live around here, is one. The cottonmouth, we're pretty much on the edge of its territory. It tends to be in the um, east, eastern part of the United States and in very wet areas. And then lastly is the most common one that you'll probably see is the copperhead, which we do have a lot. But um, they're also the least lethal of those three snakes. And all of these are known as pit vipers. Um, pit vipers are distinguished from non-venomous snakes because they have a pit between the um, eye and the nose. And they will have long fangs. And if you get a really close and personal, you can see that their eyes have an elliptical, um, vertical cat's eye pupil. And they will also have a small, smooth cap over their nose and then the, um, the characteristic triangular shaped head. So here's some pictures that you may have seen. Um, also, when you're up there getting up close and personal, you can flip them over and check your scales underneath. I'm not sure why they mentioned that. So there's a little different scale pattern between the two. Maybe you can see it in the skins after they're done. Um, so um, the copperheads, that's again, um, learning to recognize a copperhead is really, really helpful. Um, if they're young in their first year, they'll have like a, like a lemon-colored, greenish-yellow tail. And I've also heard that the juveniles um, pack more of a wallop than the adults. And some of that is because I think they inject, they use all of their venom, whereas the adults can kind of um, modulate how much venom they actually put in. But um, there is a, a water snake that looks really similar. Um, I used to think they were all copperheads until um, somebody said, no, no, that's a water snake. And so the, the markings, I would say that they look like they have chocolate chips on their side. Mm -hmm. Because the water snake is the color um, is like reversed. So the what I call the chocolate chips are lighter in the water snake and darker um, in the middle. I don't know if that helps at all, but that, that was one of the ways I distinguished um, from this water snake and the copperhead, which really just means it's how close you're willing to walk to them. <laughs> So uh, a non-venomous snake, instead of having fangs, is going to have lots and lots of little teeth. So if you did happen to get bitten by a snake, and you look, if you saw you know, big old puncture wounds, you might be concerned. Whereas if you see a bunch of tiny little horseshoe-shaped marks or scratches on your skin, um, you could probably be a little more assured that it's um, <coughs> not going to cause you a problem. Uh, most of the non-venomous snakes can't bite through your clothes, um, and they're going to have the round pupil instead of the, uh, up and down. And you actually can see that without getting too close. It's kind of cool when you start to look for that. So there's a lot of different non-venomous snakes. They come in all different uh, sizes, shapes, and, and colors. And really, the best way to deal with snakes is just avoidance. Just stay away from them. So most snake bites happen when people are trying to handle them, or move them, or kill them. So basically, just leave them alone when you see them. And um, when you're working in your garden, just be really cautious. So think about what snake habitats, uh, what snakes like for habitats. So tall grass, so weedy areas, um, log piles and rock piles and things like that. And if you're going to be working in those areas, yeah, I just, I just wanted to add to what you're saying. Um, copperheads look like bamboos. Yeah. So always wear gloves. Seriously, always wear thick gloves and don't ever. That's such a good and point. And if you think that there might be snakes if there are piles of sticks or piles of rotten wood, use your use the, the uh, handle of your rake and crook around. The fact that snakes aren't aggressive doesn't mean that you won't get bitten. If you surprise them, they will try to defend themselves if they don't think they can get away. So. And I will say that twice. I thought, I thought the book was really a little light on how dangerous it can actually be in North because you can die from a copperhead bite four or five months after from kidney failure. It doesn't have to, you don't have to get necrosis and lose a finger. You don't have to end up in the hospital at the time that you get bitten. You can still die. Later and they are on. incredibly painful, even if you don't painful. die. So, very, very painful. I personally don't 
they, they, they have um, anti-venom ashes about this. And they do have anti-venom, which makes a huge difference from, I'm not supposed to talk medical stuff, but just from anecdotally um, that they are now um, at the major universities, hospitals are using the anti-venom when people are coming in with um, copperhead bites. I think the best, the best um, defense against a copperhead is a black racer or rattlesnake because I see they do they, racers are constrictors and they can kill them. They do. And um, and they're your friend, the black snake, except when they want to climb up to your bird house. But, um, <laughs> or they're in your chicken coop. Yeah, yeah, and you can put fencing around and things like that. But, but really, I mean, I, I tell people do not, if you've got a black snake, if you want me to remove it, I'd be happy to move it out of my snake. But I, I mean, I will get a black snake and make sure I don't have copperhead because I've had copperhead problems and you do not want that. Well, and I will say that um, I've actually touched a copperhead inadvertently weeding a garden twice now. And when it moved, I pulled my hand back, and it was moving away from me as fast as I, I mean, I didn't grab it, but it, I disturbed it, and it left um, as quickly as I did, and I did not go back to that area for a while, and I was very, very cautious. Um, but also, um, when you see a copperhead, like in the, the road, um, I have tried to, like, you know, scare it away, thinking that something, I didn't want my dog to step on it, or somebody else coming along to step on it while it was in the road, and if you are bothering it, they prepare to strike. And if you just walk away, you'll see them wait till the coast is clear and then they leave. So they don't they really aren't looking to attack, but they will if you are um, aggressive towards them. So really if you just leave them alone and, and let them be and just be cautious around them, as you said. How how high is their strike? I'm just curious. Is it like two, three inches? Is it a foot? It depends on the size of the so copperhead yeah. and how coiled it is as okay. well. So if they're retreating, they're not going to right. strike if they're moving. They have to like coil up okay. to strike. And again, they're not um, they're not a kind of snake that is looking to attack you. Not if you step on it, my dogs have been bitten when they yeah. they didn't even see the snake and they step right on it and the snake bit their hand. But that's happened. Mm -hmm. there, uh, there's like a, there's some sort of like Hebrew's formula. It depends on like the, the position the snake is in, how long it has been, rarely is it more than a very little spot in the middle. Okay. Yeah. 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 Working areas. Uh, don't pile up your mulch really high. Give them uh, more places to live. And uh, keep mowing. <laughs> uh, for non-venomous snakes, if they're if you need to move them, you can sweep them into a box. Or sometimes you can take like a broomstick or something, and they'll actually curl around it or a shovel handle, and you can you know, move it away from your kid's swing set or something if they don't really want the snake right there. So they don't have to worry about stepping on it or interacting with it. Um, there can be some situations where you want to exclude snakes from a certain area. So if you do have a big problem with copperheads um, or other venomous snakes, you see them all the time, and you have an area um, like the, where the, the dogs go out routinely, or a play area for the kids that's a, a discrete area, and you just you know you don't want snakes to be in that area. You can build a snake fence. How fun is that? Um, so quarter inch wire mesh screening. So it's not very tall. Um, Thirty degree angle slanting outward, um, and thirty inches high, six inches deep. Got all the directions online if you want to do this. And then have to keep vegetation and stuff away from it so the snakes don't have some way of falling into it. Repellents aren't going to work. Um, Really lethal methods uh, are only in circumstances where there's imminent risk of injury to uh, people or pets or something, and you do not need a permit to dispatch a snake with either a long-handled shovel 
for it though, if it's something that you have to do. Um, again, only in extreme circumstances. And also important to know that the head of the snake can still be reactive, so you don't want to pick that up, even if it is separated from the body. <laughs> so you can still get a dose of venom from, from the head itself. So my neighbor uses mothball, but she puts them into, which I now know is illegal, but she puts them into like coffee cans that she puts holes in. So now we look at the coffee cans on her side of the yard. Does, does anything, uh, I'm trying, I want to try to convince her that this is for snake, that this is just not the right thing to do. Well, my understanding is that the repellents aren't effective anyway. So, and mothballs is probably not the thing that you want to have so around, they're pretty this, toxic. Yeah, I'm going to have to convince somebody who already that something's, you know, a little off. Yeah. And, and this is not working, right? So I'm thinking this makes her feel best. Tell her just to put the coffee cans out. <laughs> is, it, is it illegal? Would she be different? I don't know about this one. Yeah. But, but would she be ticketed if they were in coffee cans scattered around the yard? That I don't know. So they still sell those things, huh? I don't know. I, I don't know about that. You can ask, consult your uh, your wildlife damage control agent. <laughs> yeah, I know. So, and, and that's the last thing I'm going to mention because I've mentioned it many times already. Is that we have our wildlife damage control agents um, ready and available to help you. Obviously, you can go online and probably get a lot of the information just um, by reading their site online. Um, these agents are trained through the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission and through N NC State University. Um, so this is the website. It's, I hope it's still current. I haven't updated the slide in a couple of years, so it's <laughs> and I'm sure you can Google it um, to find the North Carolina one. But these are the ones where you're going to get your um, depredation permits, uh, which are free, um, and to request any services if you need them, which they may charge services or charge fees for. And of course, you can always call on the Master Gardener volunteers. We are free of charge. Happy to answer questions and research for you. Um, won't come out to your home, um, but we can direct you to other resources, too. Oh, so these are, uh, again, I think these are the uh, resources that you have on the internet. Um, there are a lot of this information that comes up. Any questions, comments? Thank you all.